what is up my peoples um so we watched a video on proteins um in the last one up there a couple slides up um uh, so today we're going to talk about a very special type of protein it's called an enzyme and an enzyme is i kid you not the most important of the proteins the reason being is because college board loves questions about enzymes okay and here's the really cool thing they love to throw you off um, and we'll talk about it a little bit later and kind of mention and bring it up but um enzymes are proteins and therefore they are awesome so i found this little site for us pew, pew. okay um and so let's look at see what we got here we have a um lactase enzyme so ace is really important for us we love the suffix ace because that keys us into the fact that this is an enzyme um and we have um enzyme activity with data analysis so check this out i'm going to run this sim simulation with the initial lactose ose we've seen as an ending for a carbohydrate so this is a type of sugar um we've seen that temperature here is uh 25 degrees and then the ph is at seven so we're gonna run this bad boy okay and we can check glucose concentration okay as in we have zero, but over time we increase the amount of glucose that we had. Now we started with lactose, and lactose is um, polymers, some of which are made up of glucose monomers. And so what we we saw happen here was we saw that a lactase enzyme helped us break down that glucose, uh, that lactose, so that we were left with glucose molecules so glucose production from lactose hydrolysis okay hydrolysis means break it break it down um, remember we add water and it breaks apart that polymer okay so we ran that we saw that it kind of leveled out it's more of a logistic curve um, there okay we were going to do that exact same thing but watch this we're going to take out all the enzymes okay so we didn't really get very much breakdown there um and we could not see that those things were doing so essentially what what can that tell us about a lactase enzyme well its job is to help us produce glucose um, from lactose through the process of hydrolysis okay so an enzyme helps us speed up those reactions now you guys have the ability to um uh check out this test and which is testing for monosaccharides you guys can increase the amount of glucose or lactose that's there and if we don't add any enzymes that didn't change a dang thing but if we put the enzymes back you're going to notice oh my god we were able to break down more because there was more available to us check this out we can change the temperature and see what happens and nothing was created so what probably happened to my enzyme when we increased the temperature ah something wrong okay we can put our temperature back back down to 25 but then we can make it really acidic okay give it like a, a 1 or a, a 1.3 there and then we we weren't able to create anything um and so we weren't breaking down stuff so you guys can play with this and manipulate it it's a really cool site um to to be able to like look at that um i think it would definitely help us okay so here we go um, when you're looking through that site, here are some things that, you know, just good practice for us is, can we look at the graph? Can we figure out what we're measuring? Can we figure out what the independent variable is just looking at the graph? Okay, can we figure out what the dependent variable is just looking at the graph? And what does the title tell us? Okay, so that's always super, super, super important. So like, what did we recognize about that OS? What did we recognize about having the word hydrolysis in there? What does it mean is going on? Okay, so super detailed title there. Okay. Um, also, you can kind of look at the variables that you're manipulating. So what happens when you change the initial amount of lactose? Um, what happens when we change the temperature, the pH, and obviously the lactase itself, the enzyme where we turn that on and off. Okay. Um, so that's for you guys to kind of like mess with and play with and have a little bit of inquiry and kind of decide. So if you want to pause the video and take some time and mess with it yourself, you go for it, champ. Okay. But I'm going to keep going. So we are talking about enzymes today. Um, so I'm going to give you the general theme of what an enzyme does. Okay. So we have 
a reaction that needs to occur, okay? And so this is the progression of the reaction. I know this bar pops up. I'm sorry about that. Um, and here are the free energy that is required to make these things happen. We need the reactants to transition and become completely different products, okay? So you can see here A and B were bound. We're going to have a chemical reaction occur, and now A and C are binded together, okay? So we have completely different products, okay? So it requires a certain amount of energy to let this reaction occur, okay? Now check out that same little graph, okay? A reaction and the products, okay? Um, but this time we have added a enzyme, okay? So this red line right here represents the amount of energy it would take with an enzyme, the help of an enzyme, okay? So instead of requiring this much energy and being not very energy efficient at all, we can get an enzyme to help us do the exact same job, create the exact same products, but now we're gonna be able to do it a lot faster because it requires less energy. Okay, um, and so this graph is pretty important. Um, we really like this graph because um, it doesn't necessarily show us time. It just shows us the progress of the reaction. And it's our job to infer that this one's going to be faster, probably, um, because it is requiring less energy. So we have less buildup time. Okay. All right. So here is some stuff about enzymes, okay? Again, they are proteins, um, and their job is to act on something called a substrate, uh, okay? So an enzyme binds to a specific substrate, and it's going to form this thing called the enzyme substrate complex. Um, and we are able to um, have that substrate bind at a part of the enzyme called the active site, okay? It's that region where the actual chemical reaction is going to happen, where all the action is so it's an active site um and then we also have this like induced fit model of a substrate um which brings chemical groups of that active site into the correct position and it enhances the ability of the enzyme to actually um, perform work on that substrate okay so here's a 3d model of a sub uh, of a um substrate and a uh, enzyme. Okay. So we love 3D models because proteins are 3D, right? We did all that stuff. We went through a primary, a secondary, a tertiary, and then we were putting two together and we made a quaternary structure of enzymes, um, of proteins to make us 3D. Okay. So we don't want to take for granted the fact that our enzymes are proteins and enzymes are 3D. Okay. So we have this 3D structure here and this substrate, which is going to bind to this active site. And then this enzyme can actually break down or build up depending on what the job of the enzyme is um, to create products different products unique from what the substrate is okay so let's talk about how this looks for us okay we have the shape of enzymes um, matters it is very specific form fits function we remember that from proteins okay so active sites and um, their interaction depend on the shape of the protein Okay, so let's talk for a second. The first model that we like to talk about is a lock and key model. This enzyme is specific. It will only bind to these substrates. It will only ever produce this product, okay? And so it goes through the same kind of binding steps. There's an enzyme, there's some substrates. We have the enzyme substrate complex form when the substrates bind to the active site. Okay, the enzyme remains unchanged. However, the substrate is now a product. Okay, those reactant substrates have become a different product. Okay, you see we put them together. This enzyme's job was to put those together. Okay, a second model in which we have um, is an induced fit model. So you can see here that this enzyme is kind of funky shaped. It's not as well defined as this guy. Um, so I like to tell my kids that the induced fit model is kind of like the master key. Um, it's like fancy and it can bind um, to a couple different types of substrates um, and it can act on those and create products that way. Um, and it's not, it's not a hundred percent. It is not the one enzyme per one substrate kind of binding. It kind of gets creative in how many substrates it can actually bind to. Okay. So the induced fit model, this is kind of like our master key, whereas the lock and key model is just one key, one lock. Okay, um, and then you can see the same steps occur 
enzyme substrate complex. Enzyme is left pretty much unchanged. Um, again, this one's the induced fit model, so he's got a funky shape to begin with. But then we're able to create that product, okay? So let's look at this step by step, okay? Substrates will enter an active site, okay? And this is going to happen over and over and over again. And the enzyme is going to change shapes and do this thing called conform or conformation to the substrate. Make sure it's nice and snug, okay? Second, the substrates are going to go to that active site by these small interactions of hydrogen bonds and ionic bonds. Remember, hydrogen bonds are weak bonds, so they can attach and detach really, really easily. Okay, the active site is going to lower um, the, the energy required, and it's going to make that uh, reaction happen faster. So that reaction is able to occur, and it's going to convert those um, substrates into a brand new product. Okay, you can see our colors changed and they became oriented different ways. And then the enzyme is going to release those substrates. Okay, and it's going to open back that active site up. And so it's going to be available for two new substrates to bind or however many substrates it is. Okay, so that's kind of the job of an enzyme. The enzyme's just doing work all day long, just over and over and over. Okay, so we have um, things that affect the function of the enzyme okay there are these things called cofactors these are small little molecules that bind to um, enzymes and uh, they are necessary for the enzyme function remember if the enzyme's not the exact shape that it's supposed to be it's not going to perform the correct function so we're going to see cofactors come up and we're going to see coenzymes come up when we talk about operons later in the year. Um, but these little guys bind to protein enzymes so that they can do their job a little bit better. Okay, again, we got to get them in the right shape. And so these cofactors are going to bind to those proteins and make sure that their shape is right so that they can do the job that they're supposed to. Okay, um, so they can be organic or they can be inorganic. Um, and they can be little molecules that bind. And those are called coenzymes okay so if it's if it's also another protein it's going to be a coenzyme as opposed to a cofactor but they do the same thing okay so the interaction between enzymes and their cofactor is solely to get us the correct structural um, build to the protein so that it can perform the correct job, okay? Again, we're going to see this again when we talk about operons, all right? So here's our little example. Um, here we have an inactive protein because it doesn't have any help. Um, it's not the correct shape, but it's there and it's available to us. As soon as a cofactor binds to it, okay, we can see that it now has the correct shape so that substrates can bind and it can perform its enzymatic job. Okay, same kind of concept here with a coenzyme. Um, this cofactor is a non-protein portion activator, and so it's going to bind to our uh, protein, um, our enzyme, so that now the substrate can actually bind and be broken down. Here, it was the wrong shape. Substrate couldn't bind. Here, though, now we have the correct shape. All right, so we also have things that can hinder our ability um, so we have cofactors and coenzymes. They're going to help us. They're going to make sure we're in the right shape before we go on and perform our enzymatic activity, um, our catalytic activity. Um, but here we can also have the opposite effect. Okay, so these things are called inhibitors. Okay, um, inhibitors are going to change the shape of the protein so that they're the wrong shape and it cannot actually do its job. So we had cofactors kind of swapping them on so that they do their job correctly. And now we have inhibitors where we're changing their shape in a bad way so that they cannot do the job that they need to do. Okay, so we have competitive inhibitors. And these are going to compete with where the substrate binds. So these competitive inhibitors are the wrong substrate, but they're going to stick to that active site and block that active site. So we're not actually going to be able to bind any substrates to it. And then we also have non-competitive inhibitors. Now, they don't bind to the active site. Um, but they will change the shape of an enzyme. And we've learned so many times over and over again that the enzyme's got to have the right shape. Doesn't really matter where or it's not going to be able to 
have the correct action that it needs to perform, okay? So the this looks like this, okay? You can see that the normal binding looks like this, a substrate to an enzyme. It's very specific, okay? A competitive inhibitor is the wrong shape substrate, but it does bind or likes to sit on top of that active site, and the enzyme doesn't know any better. You know, he's just an enzyme. He's got no brain, um, and so... He's holding on to a competitive inhibitor that he can't break down, which is stopping our um, substrate from binding, okay? So the second type here, the non-competitive inhibitor, is like he's not blocking the active site, but he has definitely changed the shape of our protein. This is bad news bears. We do not like this because if we are the wrong shape, we cannot do the right job, okay? So um, when we talk, about regulating uh, enzyme activity, uh, it's gonna be there to like help us control our metabolism and our metabolic pathways. Um, because if we don't have that going on, like if we're not able to do cellular respiration, big surprise, we die, okay? Um, if we can't actually do those metabolic processes that you know keep us going and keep us in homeostasis we are in trouble and enzymes regulate a lot of that okay so a cool thing about enzymes is that they know that they are important so they like to be efficient okay so we also have allosteric regulation okay so allosteric regulation it can inhibit enzymes from doing their job like guys you're doing too much you need to slow down so allosteric regulation will help us out and slow down our enzymes they're also ones that will stimulate them and speed them up. Like, we've got a lot to do. Let's pick up the pace, okay? And so allosteric regulation is super cool for helping us maintain our metabolic pathways um, and keep us in homeostasis. Okay, so an al allosteric enzyme, um, here's an example of one that has four different subcomponents, okay? So we'll have something like an activator. And an activator will stabilize these four guys and instead of only having like one active site at a time, this one's got four. And so he can take in way more substrates, he can put out way more products, and he can stimulate activity, okay? The exact same thing is if we add an inhibitor. Um, so now we've inhibited it and we've slowed it down. And so we're going to take down the, the enzyme activity a notch, um, stop it from being able to bind to substrates and uh, slow down any rates of reaction that are occurring, okay? Um, and so when we talk about allosteric regulation, it's a big cooperative um, effort of all of the enzymes so that we can amplify that activity and we can make things happen faster um, and we can get a lot of substrate being bound and broken down into um, different products depending on what that enzyme's job is. All right, so here we go. Um, one more time from the top. When we look at a substrate binding to an enzyme, um, we can go through all of these different steps. And so a enzyme isn't just a one and done thing. We might need to send it to a second enzyme. Um, we might need to send it to a third enzyme, a fourth enzyme. So this enzyme is going to break it down. And then now the substrate of this, the product of this enzyme is now the substrate of this one okay so it just works its way down the chain until we get the desired product that we want okay um we'll see this when we talk about feedback loops um but for now just wanted to show you that you know enzymes can work together um to to get desired products and, and create a chain of messages um along the way we talk about this a lot when we talk about cell communication about how we send messages from one thing to the next and one thing to the next okay uh through cell signaling pathways so let's talk about a few factors that can affect the rate of our um, enzymes um, just like in proteins uh, if we change something the protein is very picky okay so um, if an enzyme doesn't like the temperature it's not going to perform the way it's supposed to if it doesn't like the salinity if it doesn't like the pH if it doesn't like the environment that it's in um, it's going to be mm, not as efficient okay um, and then obviously chemicals can be present and change how our protein functions, okay? So let's look at these little graphs, okay? Um, every um, enzyme will have an optimal temperature and an optimal pH that it likes to operate at. 
okay? Um, this is different from enzyme to enzyme. So if we talk about the temperature of a human enzyme, um, it likes to operate uh, right around, well, I don't know, 39 degrees, um, 38 degrees Celsius, okay? Versus we look at an enzyme that's found in a thermophilic, thermophilic heat liking bacteria or a heat tolerant bacteria, its optimal temperature is going to be way up here at 79 degrees Celsius, okay? So it just depends on what um, organisms the enzymes are in, what their functions, where they're located. Um, so same kind of concept, check this out. Uh, and an enzyme that might be found helping break down food in our stomach is gonna be able to operate in a much more acidic environment than an enzyme that needs to be found in our intestines after we've already broken down the food and we need to be absorbing those nutrients. Um, and so we can kind of look at these graphs and kind of understand that every enzyme is a little unique Every enzyme has different substrates it likes to break down. Every enzyme has different um, every enzyme has different optimal temperatures and different optimal uh, pHs. Okay, so let's talk for just a second when we're looking at this. Um, we've got rate of reaction, just some practice reading our graph, and we've got temperature, so we can find how um, the same amount of enzymes or enzyme activity. Um, changes based off of the temperature. So we're low, we're low, we're low. Okay, if we're not in this optimal range, we're going to kind of drop off. Um, and so we really need to be here to actual op actually operate as an enzyme. Okay, we've got the scenario over here where we have the optimal pH. So it also does this little bell kind of a thing where we're not even going to operate at all. We might get a little bit of production out of me, but I do not like it here. And then as I get all the way up here, I'm like, oh, I'm good to go. I can operate at 8 pH for this enzyme, okay? Some things that don't really change um, the rate of the reaction um, is the substrate concentration, okay? If we have a set amount of enzymes um, and we increase the substrate com uh, concentration, concentration, it doesn't matter that there's a lot more of substrate to actually produce and actually take down. Those enzymes can only operate so fast. Um, and so we'll see like a logistic curve there where they'll kind of like even off versus if we take the enzyme itself and increase its concentration, well, the more enzymes we have, the more um, we can create reactions. And so we're going to increase constantly the rate of reaction as we um, increase our enzyme concentration. As long as there's substrate to break down, if we're continuing to increase um, our enzymes, we're going to increase that rate of the reaction, okay? Um, so I hope that this was helpful. Um, there are some videos um, in my slideshow uh, that you can go through. Here's some baby amoeba sisters uh, on protein structure uh, and what they kind of had to say. Maybe you need to recap um, denaturing. And then obviously these enzyme videos are going to be super awesome for you if you want just a different opinion on enzymes and how they operate. Um, but other than that, guys, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Talk to you later.